we've kind of hit on the fact that this axon hillock is really important because this is where there's a huge cluster of voltage-dependent sodium channels to 5 millivolts. And really the whole decision about whether I take an umbrella or not is made right here at the axon hillock. What it's going to do is weigh pros and cons. So it's going to weigh information from pro neurons out here, pro synapses, and negative synapses, and decide, do I fire this axon? How it decides that is basically, do I get enough sodium to get up to minus 55 millivolts to open these sodium channels? Because if they do, you're going to signal to another cell, this umbrella thing is a go, so start planning it or squeeze the muscles in the hand to pick it up. So then the question becomes, how much sodium does it take? But for this first part, we're just going to talk about the pros and these strengths of input are defined by something called Ohm's Law. Now, Ohm's Law is usually described in terms of electricity. It's like how fast current flows is dependent on how much it's pushed by the voltage over how much resistance there is. But Ohm's Law will describe a lot of things. It describes water through a hose, too. How fast the water comes out of a hose depends on how much pressure is on the hose behind it and what resistances are on that water. So if you have a big hose, you have less resistance and more water is going to flow. Things like that. Ohm's Law also describes the likelihood that Ella is going to get a thousand sodiums down here to the axon hillock. It's going to describe the probability of that mother-in-law is going to get a thousand sodiums down to this axon hillock. The first thing that's going to describe whether a synapse has the intensity or the strength to stimulate the axon hillock is how close is it to the axon hillock. So I kind of imagine in my brain, the Ellis synapse is really, really strong. And one of the ways it can be really, really strong is it's right next to the axon hillock. So if it dumps 1,500 sodium ions in, chances are 1,000 of them are going to make it to the axon hillock just because that synapse is so close to the axon hillock. Mother-in-law, on the other hand, whatever sodium she dumps in here, it could go in a variety of different directions. It's going to get spread out by the time it gets to the axon hillock. So the fact that this synapse is so far from the axon hillock is one of the reasons this synapse is relatively weak. Another thing described by Ohm's Law is the width of the dendrite. And basically a metaphor here is if you wanted to move a bunch of people, would you want wide hallways or would you want narrow hallways? With wide hallways, you could move those people and you could keep them right together. If you have narrow hallways, they're going to get spread out. So to kick off the axon hillock, we need a thousand sodiums in a clump to get down here. So if we've got a nice wide dendrite, or in this case on this parking dendrite, a nice wide dendrite, it's going to be easy to move the sodium in a clump down to the axon hillock and make sure we get a thousand sodiums down here to stimulate the axon hillock. If you're way out here on mother-in-law, really, no matter how much sodium you dump in there, it's going to get spread out. And so it means it's going to be hard for the synapse to get a thousand sodiums down here. The third thing is simply how much neurotransmitter is released. So when Ella, when I took her that first time, and it was a bad situation, I needed to learn once. I needed to learn really quickly. And probably the easiest way for a neuron to improve its performance is to release more neurotransmitter so more sodium is released into the target neuron. So if Ella releases 500,000 sodium, it's pretty likely that 1,000 sodium are going to stimulate the axon hillock. And kind of extending on that, Let's say, for example, let's extend into learning. Let's say, for example, that mother-in-law has this uncanny ability to predict really, really strong thunderstorms. And so for the first 25 times, my mother-in-law says, DJ, it's going to rain today. You should take an umbrella. I blow her off, and I get really, really soaked in a downpour. Eventually, I'm going to want to learn. I'm going to want to learn to make this snap stronger. It's very weak right now because it's so far away. It's on a very narrow dendrite and it's not releasing a lot of neurotransmitter. So how is it going to become stronger? Each of these methods can lead to improvement, but some are going to be easier than others. For example, a really, really weak one, but it might actually occur, is this synapse might grow an additional synapse off to the side that's going to be closer to the axon hillock. And that does happen sometimes. Those are called collaterals. There is research that if a synapse is used often, the dendrite will get wider. And so if this synapse is releasing a lot of neurotransmitter, releasing a lot of sodium into here, the dendrite will actually grow, and that will improve this synapse's performance. Again, a nice wide dendrite means that the sodium can move in a clump and make it down to the axon hillock. But probably the most likely, and I already alluded to it, the most likely way that you're going to learn is you're going to have the synapse release more neurotransmitter. So mother-in-law, if she releases a million sodiums, it's likely that the thousand sodiums are going to get down here 
to activate the accent. So that's a look at how you can get different strengths of input, but it's also important to keep in mind that all these things kind of add together, so all the pros will add together to get a thousand. So maybe Ella's not with me, that's not going to get me my thousand, but maybe parking plus mother-in-law plus the hair looks fine, those three together are going to put in enough sodium that I get to a thousand sodiums at the axon hillock. So just to come back to it and say it for about the 25th time, is neurons make decisions. Decisions involve pros and cons, and those pros and cons can be of various strength. We've kind of already covered now how you can get pros and how they can be of various strengths, but we haven't talked about cons. And so to talk about cons, how do you not, how do you negatively influence taking an umbrella? The model cell and point out that I've added another ion, the chloride ion. Therefore, please notice that chloride is negatively charged and it's more concentrated on the outside of the cell. So one of the ways you can negatively influence the axon hillock, prevent it from getting to minus 55, make the cell more negative. We can see that in a couple places. If you have to get to minus 55 and you're at minus 80, it's going to be harder to get up to minus 55. How do I get to minus 80? The simplest way is to let these negative chlorides in. If a negative chloride comes in, it's going to make you more negative. You could also open up a potassium channel, and when the potassium leaves by diffusion, it's also going to make the cell more negative. So everything up here under cons, cons were in red. Notice that a con neuron is going to either let chloride in the umbrella neuron, or it's going to let potassium out. Now these things, because it's changing the potential, are called inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So the postsynaptic neuron, here's the presynaptic neuron, is the red neurons coming in or the green neurons coming in, and the umbrella neuron is what's called the postsynaptic neuron. So that's where the inhibitory postsynaptic potential comes from. Again, presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron. While changing the membrane voltage to more negative voltages, it's probably the easiest to understand way that an IPSB has its function. There is another way that it works, and it's called a shunt. Basically what happens is these channels can just simply sit open. Then every time a sodium comes in, these channels will allow a potassium to leave or allow a chloride to leave. So then what's happening is every time sodium comes in, it wants to bring in its positive charge, but it's offset by the negative charge of a chloride coming in too, or offset by the negative charge of a potassium leaving. So it's kind of having a negative effect, just like back to the bathtub metaphor you can inhibit filling the bathtub by opening the drain. In this case, sodium would be pouring into the bathtub, mixing metaphors, but potassium and sodium would be leaving through the drain, and it would offset each other. So this is a technical, kind of a little bit hyper-technical way that these actually probably inhibit. On the pro side, it's much more simpler, because really the only way to change this voltage more positive is to let more sodium come in. And now that's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential, because it's going to excite the postsynaptic cell. In our case, it's this yellow, do I take an umbrella today, neuron. So then here, now that we've finished up with cons, take a moment to think about how there's kind of a math, a quasi-math that's occurring in the postsynaptic neuron. Sodium's coming in from some pro over here, more sodium is coming in from this pro over here, negative chloride is coming in from this con over here. So this mash of sodium coming in, chloride coming in, potassium leaving, that does a certain amount of mix-up math to determine do you get those thousand sodiums down to the axon hillock. So this is why when we make decisions we weigh a lot of pros and cons. The umbrella neuron is weighing a lot of IPSPs and EPSPs to determine do you have enough sodium coming in to stimulate the voltage dependent sodium channels in the axon hillock. If you do then it's a yes decision and if you don't then it's a no.